Hello everyone, I'm Abhishek and with me is Aaron. And today we are presenting AI Store as a fast tier storage solution to enhance your petascale deep learning jobs across remote cloud backends. So, uh, so uh, let's look at, in, in this presentation, we are going to look at what are the current challenges that we are facing with loading data from the cloud, introduce AI Store and how AI Store addresses these challenges, um, to, uh, share some production numbers and workloads with you, and finally delve into the ongoing research. So let's look at the challenges. Uh, so at NVIDIA, our GPUs are becoming insanely powerful. But here's the kicker. The IO performance isn't keeping up. This mismatch means that the GPUs are often underutilized because they can process data at a faster rate than the data can be delivered. Let's talk about data in the cloud. Storing a petabyte up there isn't just expensive. It's incredibly slow. And if your GPUs are in another region, that's another cross layer. And in such situations, latency can be a real bottleneck as well. Uh, GPU nodes usually don't have enough local storage. So if you're training for multiple epochs, you might end up re-downloading the same data again and again. If you're really unlucky, all your data might be scattered. Some might be on-prem, some might be on Azure, and some might be on AWS. And trying to get a consistent throughput and latency from this hodgepodge is like juggling lives. So training, a, training on a petabyte of data is, isn't just a walk in the park. You need the right, right tools, libraries, plugins, and operations to handle data at this massive scale. Without them, you are just left wrestling with data instead of training your models. So from what we have observed in our workloads is that um, usually machine learning workloads make random reads to a vast amount of unstructured data. And reading, ra ra reading a petabyte of data randomly without having a petabyte of RAM or any similar fast get cache, it's really difficult and slow. And hence, storage becomes the primary bottleneck in contemporary machine learning. So with all these challenges, like storage bottlenecks, latencies, and cloud, how do we keep our GPUs fed and avoid costly downtime? Let me introduce you to AI Store. So AI Store is a fully open source, lightweight software storage, uh, object storage system that is typically tailored for AI-related workloads. Uh, AI Store offers linear scalability with each added node or drive. So if you are adding more storage nodes to your cluster, you'll increase your I.O. by that proportion. In AI Store, you can easily scale up and scale down your cluster at any time. There is literally no limitation. Uh, you just need a machine with a disk. Uh, AI Store is deployable anywhere. You can deploy it on a teeny tiny VM to multi-petabyte Kubernetes cluster. AI Store is in development for over seven years, and we are also in production for certain workloads at NVIDIA. So let's take, at a, take a look at the overview of AI Store. At the crux of the system, we have two main components, AIS proxies and AIS targets. AIS proxies are lightweight endpoints which the clients reach out to. AIS targets are the storage nodes which house the disk and where the data is stored. So AI Store features an elastic cluster which can grow and shrink at any time. There is no limitation on the number of proxies, the number of targets, or disk per target. All the targets use a generic backend interface to connect to multiple different cloud providers or to multiple different AI Store clusters. You can connect to any S3 compatible object store as well. And AI Store in itself is an S3 compatible object store. You can also have multiple S3 profiles so that you can load data from different S3 profiles in different, on different S3 compatible object stores. To connect to AI Store, we have a lot of front-end APIs. We have our native, native uh, HTTPS REST support. On top of that, we have built a Go and Python-based SDK, which developers can easily integrate into their existing applications and workflows. We also have an easy to operate and set up AI CLI that you can use to monitor and uh, manage your cluster with. And again, AI Store itself is an S3 compatible client. 
a S3 compatible object store. So you can use your ex any existing S3 compatible clients like Boto3, S3 CMD, or AWS CLI to connect to AI store without any learning curve. This architecture was designed for flexibility and scalability in mind, where you can easily add more nodes and scale up the infrastructure easily. Let's take a look at some of the key features that make AI Store special. Uh, so AI Store is highly available and it has robust data protection. We achieve this using NVA mirroring, erasure coding, self-healing, and lifecycle management. Another uh, exciting feature of AI Store is its capabilities to run ETL jobs. So you can run custom ETL data transformation jobs in line like when you're making requests to the server, you can get transformed data, and also offline, where you can transform the entire data sets and store it on AI Store for subsequent computation. Every storage node in AI Store is responsible for processing the data that resides on that node. And hence, if you add more storage nodes, you're increasing with that factor your entire data processing. AI Store shows read after write consistency and write through caching. So if your workload is writing to AI Store, other workflows can pick it up and have the same data consistently. Uh, we have seamless integration with Kubernetes. We have an open source AIS operator that uh, does essential tasks such as bootstrapping the AI Store cluster, deploying it, managing it, scaling up, or even gracefully shutting down the AIS cluster. Um, a key problem with large scale model training and big data is that small files. So AI Store handles small files using archives and we support a lot of archive formats as you can see on the screen. Uh, uh, so we, uh, we, like, we do sharding of original data sets. You can add data to the existing shards. You can also reshard your data and you can, without extracting the shards, you can read the data which I think is a very developer productive feature. AI Store has its own authentication server, which is OAuth2 compliant, where you can have role-based access control. You can customize everything from clusters to uh, roles to users and assign users those roles. Um, so you, you can even re register multiple different AI Store clusters to one Authn server, and you can easily secure and manage your data with Authn. So when you're dealing with large amounts of data, it becomes very difficult to like process data. So for that, we have batch jobs, which can, you can easily start, stop, or monitor. We perform a lot of batch operations, such as prefetch, copy, download, and transform. They run, they run on, like each storage node is responsible for the, playing their part. So it, this operation is massively parallel, and it scales up as you add nodes. So let me show you how you can get an object and how AI Store intelligently stores it on the target. So imagine you have a cluster and you have clients. That clients can be anything. It can be your machine learning workloads. So if you reach out to a proxy asking for a certain object on AI Store, the proxies are intelligent systems. They know exactly on which target the data is stored on or which target is responsible for pulling the data from the cloud. So in turn, they send a redirect request to the client telling the client where the actual data resides. The client then reach out, reaches out to the target, requesting the data or the object. If the object is not found locally, as in on that storage node, the target will make a call to the remote backend and store the data on the disk, and then return the same object back to the user or the client. So how here is where the efficiency of AI stores shines. So all subsequent gets to the same object from any client will be directly returned from the target instead of making the remote call to the backend. So this not only saves egress cost, but also saves like increase, like the AI store cluster is usually in the same region as your GPU nodes. And that's why you get a bit better throughput and latency for your subsequent reads. In this image, we are showing how like AI Store is deployed and an overall architecture. So you have your compute nodes, which might be a lot of GPU nodes, and you have your slow tier, which is your remote backends like uh, remote clouds, on-prem object stores, something like that. 
So AI store sits in the middle uh, between the GPU nodes and the slow, uh, slow supported backends. And AI store intelligently caches the data in the first epoch so that subsequent epochs can directly be returned from the fast tier. So this multi-cluster, multi-cloud environment helps you to unify all your storage resources under one single cohesive system. Finally, let's take a look at how AI Store is deployed onto Kubernetes. So imagine you have a Kubernetes cluster with N nodes, and you want to deploy an AI Store cluster. The very first thing that you can do is deploy or set up the AIS operator. So AIS operator is responsible for a lot of essential things, like bootstrapping the cluster, uh, scaling up the cluster, managing the entire life cycle of the cluster. AI Store operator in turn uses native Kubernetes APIs to manage the entire life cycle of AI Store. With AIS operator, we also deploy an AI Store uh, custom resource definition, which has all the logic to bring up the proxies and the targets. So if once the AI Store operator is completely deployed and running, you can now apply a specification of AI Store CRD, which will mention the number of proxies and the targets that you want. So based on that, uh, the very first thing that comes up in the cluster is AIS proxies. So the proxies uh, start up and they are registered with an AIS proxy service. Once the proxies are up and running, then we bring up the targets. So the targets register to the cluster through proxies. So they register to the proxies through the proxy service and the whole cluster comes up. So let's take a deeper look into how the targets are actually uh, set up. So each target has multiple different disks. Each disk, we are, so we have a PV over the entire disk and these PVs are mounted to the pod using persistent volume claims. So in this uh, deployment, which we are going to show, we have all the disks of that node mounted onto the pod using PVs and PVCs. So this helps us to manage the AI store cluster efficiently and store data for easier retrieval. Thanks, Abhishek. So now that we've covered AI store as a fast tier, uh, let's go into some benchmarks to see what you can expect from a real world per, uh, deployment. So we'll take a look at one of our production clusters, which we have running in Oracle Cloud infrastructure. We have a 16 node cluster running on what Oracle calls uh, BM dense IO nodes. Uh, it's a bare metal config uh, with most importantly, some really fast high performance drives and 100 gigabit NICs on every node. So we've got about 1.2 petabytes of storage across the 16 node cluster over the 192 drives. And so for this benchmark, uh, we're gonna be benchmarking that with our own tool called AS Loader. So AS Loader is a load generator that we wrote to benchmark AS Store and S3 compatible backends. Uh, it basically really efficiently multi-threaded goes, makes requests to the cluster and discards the data. So it's, the goal is to just completely saturate this AS Store cluster to see what it can do. So as, as you see, there's over a thousand client threads as it's scaled across our cluster of AS, AS loader nodes. And every one of these AS loaders is running on the same uh, spec as the actual cluster so that we have plenty of bandwidth. So we ran three different types of benchmarks um, to test this cluster. Um, so first of all, we have a direct git. So that's just going straight to the S3 backend, no AI store involvement at all. Then we have our cold git. So this is the initial retriever, retrieval of an object through AI store, where AI store will go out to that backend, it will get that data, it will write it to disk, and it will return it to the user. Then finally, we have warm git. So for warm git, those objects already exist on the cluster. AI store goes in, gets those objects, and can quickly retrieve them. So one note on our tests is we did use a Swift stack object store um, just because it's uh, closer to our AIS cluster, uh, better connectivity, and that matters a lot as we'll see. So this is just some of the uh, relative uh, performance numbers we got. As you can see, there's a direct git, which we used as our baseline of just one, and then cold git, there's a slight performance penalty as we might expect because we are writing to disks. And then warm git, in this case, we saw over a 10x performance improvement. 
So one thing to keep in mind, though, is that 10x performance improvement is very much a function of your cluster configuration. So as we'll see with AI store scaling, it doesn't necessarily tell the whole story. So this is just kind of a quick look at what it looks like if you have a lot of clients pulling the same data from a cluster. So you can see at the start here, we have 16 AS loaders that are running against this cluster, and every one of those requests at the very beginning is going out to the remote backend. So we're only seeing about 15 gigabyte gigabytes per second of performance. But since, since all 16 AS loaders are loading the same data set, eventually those objects start to be retrieved from the cluster itself. And so you can see that exponential curve as more and more of the requests are actually resolved from AIS store disks. So one of the most important features of AIS store is the scaling. And so when we ran these warm gets, one of the things we were able to observe was all 16 of the AIS store nodes providing an equal throughput across the cluster. All 16 are providing 11.1 .1 gigabytes per second of storage, and we, that's really just the most important thing with those benchmark numbers we saw before, right? So we said 10x performance, but if you add 10 more or 16 more nodes, you're gonna see that go up to 20 times performance because it's all scalable. Oh, and one more note about this, you'll also notice really stable uh, performance numbers throughout the whole run. This was over a couple of hours, and you don't see any big spikes or drops because all of these clusters are able to continue to provide that throughput. One other important feature, right, is the individual targets so that they can scale with the disks you add. So here we saw, I believe it was 12, 12 drives per node, and you see that because all the objects are stored across all of the different nodes, you see that they're all about 95% utilization because they're all serving different objects. So one of the things we wanted to look at when we were looking at this cluster and running these benchmarks is what exactly our bottleneck would be, like what, what's holding us back? Because our goal is to scale up with the hardware that we're given. And one of the things we noticed actually was that our network utilization was definitely our limiting factor. So what we have here is the graph of total network bandwidth, and if you can see that number, it's around 15, 29 gigabits per second. So theoretically, these NICs can give us a maximum advertised throughput of 1,600 gigabits per second. So we're coming up really close to that limit, and so there's really nothing else that these NVMe drives can do, right? They've completely saturated our network bandwidth. So this is one of the things, too, that you may not expect to see depending on your workload. Um, because with faster NVMe drives, maybe you want that latency. Maybe you need to use those just to get the objects back faster. But what we saw here is that it's just entirely the network that's holding us back. So we were starting to wonder, right, what should we be able to expect from these disks? And so we ran the industry standard FIO benchmark to kind of get an idea of what we should be seeing, right? So with these disks, we'd expect to see around three gigabytes per second per drive for this use case of 10 megabyte object reads. So for a 192 drive cluster, we can extrapolate that all the way up. But that's not what we saw. <laughs> so even with, with that, we also had this disk read reduction, right? Because all of these objects, a certain percentage of them are going to be stored in page cache. So in the end, we only saw the drives doing about 26% of the theoretical bandwidth that they could provide. And so again, this kind of brings up the idea of specking your cluster configuration to the workloads you're going to be doing. Because we were limited in this case by the options from our cloud provider. Um, we picked these E5 dense IO nodes because of their high network bandwidth. But ideally, we have more disks, maybe slower disks, and especially more network. So in a real work workload, you might not see this 
play out because you probably won't have that level of sustained network uh, load that our AIS loaders are doing. So maybe this is something that would work for a good production cluster. But in this case, <laughs> it's very much bottlenecked by network. But if this is the case, you can still add more performance by simply adding more nodes. So I wanted to take a quick look at a snapshot of an actual production workload running against this cluster. So in this case, our clients had 16 worker nodes and over 1,000 worker threads pulling data from separate shards. Um, you'll notice here we have some initial spikes and then it lowers down as the clients go back to actually training the model. And that throughput drops way down. So you might notice that we've got over 1,000 threads here. There's 16 separate nodes. This is pretty similar to our benchmark. So why are we only seeing half the total throughput? So we looked into that. We're only seeing about 84 gigabytes per second there. And we looked into that, and we actually realized that because of our Prometheus scraping, we actually are only getting an average over that interval. And while this doesn't look great from a statistics perspective, it's actually a really good thing. Because what we've done here is these workloads, which previously would have had to wait for the data, are able to get that data quickly, get back to work, and they're not waiting on data. So they're able to pull their entire buffer of data before our stats interval even captures that they're loading the cluster. Also wanted to point out that this is two jobs run over the course of three days. So that's a pretty long, sustained amount of throughput right there as well. So now that we've covered the basics, uh, some of the use cases and performance numbers, um, I just wanted to do a quick walkthrough of actually getting started with AI Store in Kubernetes. So let me roll this here. So the prerequisites for running AI Store in Kubernetes are basically just that you have a Kubernetes cluster, you have kubectl configured with access to that cluster, and that's about it. So here we've got a three node cluster, and I've got the nodes labeled with AIS proxy and AIS target labels. And that's because we use node affinity to handle our scheduling. So the next thing to do is to log into the cluster and look at what our disk config is gonna be like. And in this case, we have 16 drives, each with about 5.8 terabytes of storage, XFS formatting, and mounted on slash AIS. So we wanna make a note of this for uh, configuration of the cluster later. And also, we just don't have any other pods running outside the namespace in this case, right? Everything's in cube system. We don't have any other namespaces. It's a pretty clean cluster. So like we said before, all the AIS deployment is actually managed by our own AIS operator. So this will take a AIS custom resource, and it will create everything the cluster needs to bring up pods and get started with the cluster. We do offer a Helm chart to install this. Uh, but in this case, I'm going to use our included Helm file um, to install Cert Manager as well. And once that's up and running, we'll be able to take any AIS store custom resources and build the cluster. So our AIS charts, Helm charts themselves, are actually just stored in our Kubernetes repo for now. Um, so we'll just use the Helm file here to help us configure a deployment. Uh, Helm file is pretty useful because it lets us do separate environments for some of our different deployments um, and have it all in, in code. So here, I created a new environment and I've uh, enabled TLS. And for each new environment, you also need to set uh, new config files for each of your sub, sub charts. Here I'm setting up some TLS charts um, just to set up a self-signed certificate. And you know, usually you would probably use a trusted CA, but this will just let me get a quick demo. So the next thing to do is set up some cloud credentials. Um, I'll create a new namespace and add some credentials based on my local. And this is also optional, but this will give us access to my specific cloud buckets. So now we can finally move on to the actual Helm chart values for AI Store. So these first, this first section is just general cluster config information. Uh, I'm setting nodes. I'm setting the mount paths to what we saw before. And then 
Moving down, I can set the size of the cluster, whether to use TLS, and then eventually we'll get down to the images we're going to use. And these are just our latest releases. So finally, we can run a Helm file sync. And then that will go ahead and create the custom resource on the cluster. And it'll bring up the namespaces, the persistent volumes, all their claims, uh, the stateful sets, all the mounts, the pods, everything we need. So here, you can watch the pods actually come up as the operator creates them. And once those are ready, we can actually move on to using the cluster. So to use the AI store cluster, we actually need access to all of the target nodes. And so the easiest way for this case, without a load balancer, we can just SSH into one of the nodes. And here I'll just set up some quick access to the cluster. I'll add the certificate that we need to trust. And I'll add the endpoint. And I already have the AI store CLI installed on this node. So that's all we need. AI store is running, we've set the proxy as our endpoint, and we can actually look at the cluster. So here you can see that we've got three proxy nodes and three target nodes all running, and we can see our total disk capacity. We can view any of the configs. There's a lot of configs you can change within the cluster, lots of features. And then we can even go ahead and start creating buckets, putting files in buckets, listing buckets, and getting objects. So we can also, because I added those AWS configurations, we can access my remote S3 bucket and list objects. We can see that this value is not cached. And for just a simple example, we can get that object, get the content, and any future calls, that object is cached. So all future, all future calls will be using the AS store disks themselves. So that's just a really quick demo of setting up AS store on Kubernetes. Um, there's a lot more features available, obviously, uh, but that's just all it takes to get started with a production level deployment of AI Store in Kubernetes. So obviously a lot of that can change, um, but the main thing is Kubernetes and Helm make the deployment simple. So, so I wanna talk a little bit about some of the current projects we're working on and what we're planning for the future. So ETL, our feature for uh, batch jobs doing the transformation in the cluster is a pretty important feature for uh, AI training loads. Um, there's a few things we know we can do to improve usability, of course, uh, improve performance, and scale up better. Um, for AuthN, our uh, authentication and authorization feature, um, we want to extend some of those extra features, um, build a more highly available deployment, and integrate with some of our existing IAM. And then cloud credential management is one thing we need to address as well. Um, AI Store is mostly designed for a single tenant use case. And one of the requests we've had as we've had some multi-tenant clusters is an ability to have better management of different cloud credentials for different backends. And finally, we want to experiment with some new cluster variations. Uh, AS store scalability obviously means we want to try to scale up as much as we can. And so we want to try some really large scale clusters. We've done 16 node, we've experimented some with larger, but we want to go into the hundreds and see exactly what we can do. Hyperconverged clusters are another interesting point that we want to explore. We have the idea, right, where AS store can actually run on the same nodes as GPU nodes. And so if you can do that, then you just remove a lot of the problems with network. And then finally, we want to look at multi-tier solutions. So AI store clusters can support a separate AI store backend. So you can have some AI store clusters that are faster, maybe another AI store cluster that's slower, cheaper, um, and there's a lot we can do there. So that's just a quick overview of AI store. Uh, we've talked about how to get started and just a few of the long list of features. Um, if you're interested in taking advantage of AI Store's performance, um, check out our blog, check out our GitHub, um, make commits, open PRs, and uh, come talk to us at the NVIDIA booth. Uh, with that, I'd like to open up for any questions. Sure. Uh, 
can you uh, ask on the mic? Uh, can we use uh, Triton inferencing server to use this AI store? Sorry, can you uh, raise the volume on that a little? Right. Yeah. So can we use uh, the Triton inferencing server to use the AI store as the object storage for loading the models? Sorry, I wasn't able I'm to catch not, that. I'm not able to hear you. Uh, is it audible? Yeah, this is better. Uh, so can we use uh, the Triton inferencing server to use the AI store as the object storage to load the models. So we have use cases where we use MinIO or S3 to store okay. our models mm -hmm. and okay. uh, load that in a Titan inferencing server from the NVIDIA. So if you don't know the answer, that's fine. But just curious to see if uh, we can start using the AI store instead of the other object storage. So you're talking about loading the models themselves out of an object store rather than just the data? Yeah, basically, like currently, we are using some ob other object storages hmm. to store our models How big are your and models? use that in the NVIDIA inferencing servers to build and cache them. Yeah, we don't have any like specific behavior built in for to handle inferencing like that. You can definitely store any anything you want as an object, but we don't have a specific inference. Load. Okay, I, I think my question was like more on does uh, the Triton server is compatible with the AIS storage. So we, maybe we can take this offline, but yeah, definitely curious to know. We haven't experimented with Triton right now, but you can store anything in NVIDIA. Like we have also stored, check, like we are trying out to store checkpoints in one region on one AI store cluster and retrieve it in another region. So it's com like if your models are objects, you can store them in AI store. Okay. Okay, sounds good. I have a question about the viability of AI store as a general purpose object storage. Um, you only showed the results for gets. You didn't show anything for posts. I would imagine posts are much slower because you have to write them in two places, mm -hmm. local drives as well as backend object storage. So any comments on how slow posts are? And I have a second question. Yeah, so we've, we've done some benchmarks on puts as well. We focus on gets pretty heavily because AI store, um, you know, obviously focus on AI, AI workloads, which do a lot more reading than putting, especially in our clients. Um, for our put usage, I think we saw pretty, pretty comparable numbers to actual S3 backends. Yeah. We'd have to, if, you want, if we want to come by later, I think we have some actual numbers we can share on that. Um, but I don't, I don't remember there being much of an actual performance hit for yep. puts. So I have a benchmark which compares the object sizes and the throughput we, which we are receiving for puts. So maybe I can show that benchmark with you. It's on my uh, personal laptop right now, which is not yet connected. But uh, we have the benchmarks, which we can show you. Sounds good, thank you. Yep. And my second question is, um, how do proxy nodes map requests to specific storage nodes? Is it like the metadata um, based on you know, consistent hashing? Is it stored somewhere else? Is it stored in persistent storage? Is it stored in memory? Like, yeah, it's a uh, hashing function that pulls basically based on some metadata stored by each, each node. Yeah, thank you. Hey, guys, good presentation. Okay. So do you find the need to anybody ask for snapshots in your AI store, like any, like any of your kind of use, use cases? Can, can you repeat? I couldn't S hear. Snapshots. snapshots. Like storage, like object level snapshots or things like that. Anybody care? Nobody's asked the question before. So what do you mean by snapshots? Snapshots, okay. Generally storage systems have snapshots, like for files or objects or volumes. Or can, you, can you speak closer to the mic? Generally storage systems have like these snapshot schemes. Okay. For a given file, volume, whatever, you can take mm -hmm. snapshots and keep multiple copies of versions of it. Yeah, we use version, there's a versioning feature uh, with checksums. Uh, we typically use, I believe it's xhash. Yeah, there are multiple things that you can yeah, use. Yeah, but it supports the same ones as AWS so, as well. Okay. There's a blog on out-of-band writes and reads in AI store. So in case your object is changing by, by some other client, we can also pull that object. So there's a completely different blog on that. Maybe you can visit the booth and we can talk more on that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, they're telling us we're out of time for questions, so uh, come I talk to us. I had the same questions, fine. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.